Hello, everybody. Um, let me make sure that we get to the right screen here. Uh, my name is Pat Myers, um, and this is what is our third volume of Office Hours with Professor Pat. Um, we are going to go ahead and get right into it. Uh, first thing, as we always do, is just chat about what are we doing here. So we're trying to build a community of capture folks. We don't necessarily have to go on the technologies that we use here at ZA Consulting, which is primarily FSOFT for intelligent capture. Uh, we also want to hear what you're doing and how you're solving problems and everything else. So, you know, please feel free um, to email me or get a hold of me on social media and ask questions, um, give me alternatives, and, and we can chat about it. Um, this is informal. So during this session, even though I prepared some, some uh, slides, um, please ask questions at any time. There's questions inside of the, the WebEx um, area in the control panel, so ask them and we're gonna just kind of hop back and forth between those two things. Um, one of the things that I think that I, I'm a little bit, uh, um, don't tell customers as much as I probably should, um, is just making sure that they keep current. Um, with my customers, we, we kind of go over this quite a bit and I'm aware of what versions are at because we actually um, do first level support. And so when they're having issues, we can, we can start talking about what their upgrade plans are um, as, we, as we get close to um, the, the end of life or end of support for a particular version. Uh, there was some slight modifications just because of everything that's going on inside of the support for July 2020 for 4145, uh, but I think that that's going to start taking track, and that's why I'm putting this up here now. And whereas it looks like 4.5s are going to be pretty much out this year in its entirety, 4.1s and 4.5s um, by September. And then we're going to roll in the 2019s and the 2020s. Uh, versions. If you have any questions on that and what exactly end of support means, um, you know, we can get into it a little bit further. Um, generically, what it really means is if you're running it and there's an issue, um, you may not be getting a hot fix for that particular version. It's not like we're going to just say, hey, tough luck, um, or FSOF's not going to say tough luck. Uh, but what it means is that if there's something that needs a hot fix, you probably need to do an upgrade as opposed to um, just getting a hot fix. So, uh, just be cognizant of what's going on and what those dates are and where you fall if you're using Evasoft. Um, that way you don't get caught in that situation. Um, last week, as we've been going over kind of like last week's questions, um, one of the questions that came up, detecting a key value requires a key and a value. What happens if there's no value um, or no key on the page? Um, so... There's, there's several ways that you can take care of that. Um, one of the ways is using the key and the value um, as the same thing. And so if it has a unique pattern, um, in this case, they're looking for like a receipt number and that pattern might be a capital letter followed by seven digits. Um, you can look for that on the key, just overlap the value area inside of that um, and say that key and that value are one and the same, look on a particular part of the page or the entire page, every page, first page, last page. Um, so you can be pretty specific about what you're trying to do to lift that as you do with other key value pairs. And, and when this was asked, um, it was specifically talking about, we were talking about um, page process extraction, which does extraction on every single page inside of um, the, the batch because it's before classification goes on and, and, and assembly, which separates different documents. Um, but it can also be used in the same fashion if you're trying to um, look for a particular pattern for extraction as well. Uh, you can also use regular regex. Um, so if inside of the extraction, if you're trying to get a value for a particular field, then you're also able just to say, hey, look for a pattern. So if it's something unique like a social security number, uh, a VIN number for a vehicle, a policy number, a patient number, a client number, um, that has a specific value that you don't think is going to occur in a specific pattern, then you can just use regular expression. Um, and so what that means is on every single page, it'll look for that regular expression. And you can also use a label that doesn't necessarily belong to the thing you're looking for. And what I mean by that is uh, the, the human mind, um, I, I know this because I taught the class for a long time um, uh, for, for Episoft, a lot of people will be like, okay, well, I have to find the, uh, the, the due date. And so, of course, you're going to use the label due date and then look to the right of it. 
um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do that. And so if there's another label that has nothing to do with due date in this case, then just use whatever that thing is. If you find some consistency, then just use that. The next question was, will assembly script override other assembly? And so again, to, to go back, assembly is when, in this case, Episoft is putting pages back together in document form. So finding first, middle, and last pages, and then making that a document that has a series of pages or a single page in some cases. Um, in this case, we're talking about scripting, and it really depends on the order of your plugins. And so on the back end of Episoft, there is a workflow, and that workflow is very linear. And so it's just use this plugin, use this plugin, use this plugin, and then it builds onto itself. So in this case, if you have the assembly script after the assembly plugin, then you can override that which is there. You also have the capability of changing the order of that. Uh, we at, Episoft, at Zia Consulting with Episoft typically use it after the fact to override that uh, which is inside of the assembly. And so if we're using something like search classification, we let it build on upon itself in that fashion. And then um, we might want to change that. And so the example that we gave last time is we might want to look for um, page number. And so we use page process key, um, page key value to look for if there's any sort of pagination on the pages. And then we might use the assembly script to override whatever um, Episoft thought it was inside of um, our particular logic. And the other question that we had on was, are there good resources finding common OCR mistakes, for example, uh, CD is actually D, RN is actually M. Um, and so the short answer is underneath the hood of Episoft, there are two OCR engines, depending on if you're on Windows or if you're on Linux. In the Windows world, you use Ricosar. In the Linux world, it uses Nuance. Um, we do often modify that, and there's an easier way within the Windows world using the Ricostar project editor or the IDE. Um, and so you can modify, um, and you can also do some, some preliminary uh, pre-processing to modify the resolution, fix solution, and things of that nature. But let's, let's actually take a look at what that looks like because me just saying it doesn't really do much justice. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go inside of the, the Windows Explorer here, and we're gonna take a look at, uh, let me make sure I open up my comments here too. In case somebody asks questions. Um, we're gonna open up the file, uh, Windows Explorer, and we're gonna go into the files of um, the backend of FSOft. And so inside of FSOft, there's this area of batch um, shared folders. For every single batch class, there's gonna be association associated batch identifier. In this case, we're gonna look at BC1, um, which has all of the files that support the configuration for that particular batch class. If you look under fixed form extraction, you can see that there are these various F, um, RSP files if we were able to see the extension, which is the RicoStar project. The one that is used by default is this FPR.RSP. So let's go ahead and open that up and open up the IDE. So this is the project and the, the corresponding steps that it takes to do an OCR. So what you can do if you're trying to manipulate this, and let's go ahead and bring a sample in here, is you can take a look to see what that does. Um, one of the things that I did inside of my configuration is I, um, I'm looking to see what the RicoStar image, and I'll kind of describe what that means in a second. And so you can see this is not a great um, illustration. Let's go ahead and take away that um, RicoStar image for a second and and you can see that it has a lot of noise you know the my expectation for OCR is not fantastic for this particular sample um, however if I go ahead and show my RicoStar project and I play this so it'll take a moment then it runs through these steps you can see that some of the optimizations that it has it has removed shading detect paper area auto rotate remove line system um, and you can see it's not it's not great but if you can see the cleanup there's a big difference between what was there and and what um, 
what it became before it did the OCR. It's not manipulating the image that it's going to be using to concatenate that document that you're going to export at the end of the day. This is just an op optimization for how it's going to manipulate the image before it tries to look for the letters and characters that are on that particular page. Um, you can manipulate this project. And so if you knew that you had a lot of noise here, we might want to say that, um, and, and again, this is the default that we're looking at right now, that we want to, in this case, remove black speckles. Um, and so you can see that there's some configuration for that particular step as well. Um, if we were to run this project, it might be a little bit better. Um, like I was looking for this particular word right here, this invoice, it's still not good. Um, and we might want to manipulate that to be various, uh, a different configuration for what mode it's going to remove black speckles. And you can see that we can clean that up pretty good. Now it says invoice number. And so if you're using that, and in this case for um, tabular, um, for a, a table header, we might be able to actually get more of that, or in this case, a keyword, actually. It's this first, it's this first word that I was looking at, this invoice number. You can see that it's pretty good now, and we might be able to use that to grab the invoice number and do some cleanup. I'm just using this as an example. Um, you have to make sure that once you make this modification that it's not changing things to a, 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 to a point where you're now worsening the, the OCR um, level um, or the accuracy. Um, and hold on one second, we do have a question coming in. Is there a way to do this without going into RicoStar project app? Um, inside of the, the HOCR plugin, um, not to this level. Um, so going in, uh, the question is, is this is uh, being called from the Episoft and we'll go ahead and go inside of that. Um, let's go ahead and just go inside of the generic one. Um, so this is what a batch class looks like inside of the batch class management user interface. And what you can see here is what I was talking about a while ago around just linear workflow. There's these groupings that are called modules. They're just a logical grouping. They really have no functionality other than when you're inside of a batch instance management, you can restart it from a particular plugin. Um, I mean, sorry, from a particular module, not from a plugin. And so um, what the question is, is like there's, this is the plugin that calls that particular uh, functionality. So um, by default, this is not going to be e-text. I had manipulated that, um, but it's using this. Oh, sorry. Here we go. It's this fpr.rsp. And so you can have your own. You can have several different ones. You can see that there's some for multi-language or for barcode support. Um, so there's different RSP files, that, and those get propagated by whatever's inside of the folder that we just navigated to. Um, but you can see here that there's certain things like de-skewing, auto-rotate. They are available through the, the RicoStar plugin per se. Um, so some optimizations that you can do there. But when it comes to those cleanup steps, um, like if you want to double the resolution or a despeckle like I just did, you have to actually go inside of that project to do that manipulation. And then it's just going to start using that configuration from then on out. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, but going back inside of here, um, then we can save this. And in this case, we're saving it directly to, um, in this case, we're saving it directly inside of that um, location where it's being utilized inside of Episoft. So don't do this in real time on your production server, of course. Um, but you are able to do some uh, additional cleanup of these particular um, images that are getting processed inside of this, um, inside of this tool. So anyway, just wanted to go into that one a little bit deeper than we did last time. All right. So um, one of the questions that we got here was a big a doozy. Um, can one better generalize extraction rules for a lot of variations? Are there specific do's and don'ts for extraction? Are the key value extraction? Are there um, key value extraction tips and tricks? How would you use hidden or read only fields to aid extraction regarding OCR uh, versus e-text? Is e-text always better than OCR? So that's a lot of stuff. Um, and probably, um, I know that there's been a lot of advertisements around these master's classes um, that you can take with various folks. And, you know, this pretty much can be one of those um, and or another book. Um, so so let's let's rewind heavily um, and, and, and figure out <laughs> what does that all mean? And so we're not going to get into that to that level um, today. Uh, just 
sorry, um, you know, we, we, we may be using this for additional questions um, or additional um, sessions that we're gonna have and just really kind of dig into it, depending on uh, what questions are being supplied by folks that are attending um, or that are signing up for this particular um, or these sessions. Um, so let's go into it. What, what is extraction? Let's start there and then we can go into the different types. So extraction is, I have a field, and so there's a piece, you might refer to it as you know, indexing or metadata for a particular document type. Um, so this might be the due date on an invoice. It might be a VIN number on something that you're doing for you know, car insurance, um, various things that you're trying to extract to automate processes. At the end of the day, um, the reason that you're doing this is so it can be found, archived correctly, automate um, a different process, that's what you have this information for, not only the document type, but these fields. And so there's a ton of ways that you can get information off of the document once it was, uh, once it was classified. Uh, so let's go through the different ones and hopefully I'm not missing any here. So there's RicoStar Extraction. What RicoStar Extraction is, um, we were just in RicoStar, so this, uh, I can make the, um, the, the difference between the various uses of RicoStar in this case. Um, RicoStar is used for the OCR, but it can also be used for a fixed form project. So a fixed form project in, is not necessarily, it's kind of a, um, a misnomer to some extent, but it's the same that you know, on page one, I'm trying to find something. And the reason that I say that it's a misnomer is because you can make rules of saying like, look in this general area for a key and then find something that's associated with it that's after the fact. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, within this pixel and this pixel, find this thing and lift it. It can be that as well. Um, so RicoStar Extraction gives you the capability of doing this. It's typically used for very fixed form type of services you can't do through other traditional type of extraction. Um, those things are what's called OMR or optical, uh, optical markup recognition um, checkboxes. So if you had a series of checkboxes or a checkbox that you wanted to lift, then you're able to um, create a project that gets those. But you can also use it when you wanna be very explicit. And I just showed you some of the, the things that you can do with the, the RicoStar project to say, um, you know, I wanna refine this particular area. I wanna remove tables. Um, I, I wanna do things before the OCR. You can even refine it more for a RicoStar extraction project. And um, so I might be looking for something very explicit in a particular area. And I might say that I want to restrict the character set. So it's not only the um, manipulation of the image, but I know that inside of this area, it should only be capital letters. And so now I can just get rid of things that it might be around lowercase or numbers or other special characters inside of there. I can say the only thing that can, this can be is uppercase letters. Um, and then be able to refine it to that effect. And, and the same thing goes with what you're trying to extract. You can say, I know that it's this pattern. So it is a VIN number or it is a social security number or it is this kind of other um, type of uh, uh, pattern. And so then you can be very explicit and then that manipulates the OCR to be able to say, okay, well, if that's what I'm looking for, then of course, you know, that I think that that might be a four, but actually it must be an A because you told me that a four can't exist in there. So very long-winded examples of what you can do in RicoStar extraction. Um, when it comes down to it, uh, we typically would use this for doing checkboxes um, or doing signature detection. So you can do things like saying, um, look at this particular area and just make sure something's written on that. We can't do like a recognition of that, um, that signature, um, but you can say, was something there? Is this not a blank form? Uh, we did have another question here, RicoStar versus uh, ImageMagic settings for thresholding, despeckle, image, resources, which one's better? Um, wow, so that's another really good question um, in which um, there's a long-winded answers for that. Uh, so I would say that um, if you're using RicoStar, um, we would typically do it inside of the RicoStar project. The biggest difference is between what you're gonna do from an image magic perspective, um, and, and I'll get into what that this question really means for those that may be new or just not sure what the differentiation is. Um, 
the image magic ones, I'm going to put a really high level answer and then we can, we can, you can reach out to me and we can get very explicit. Um, things that are going on with image magic, graphics magic, are going to occur on the image. So that's going to be something that you export. The things that you're doing inside of RicoStar are going to be, do, be done um, in, inside of the RicoStar project are going to be done for um, the OCR of that. And so that's not something that you're going to save at the end of the day and export. Um, there's different ways that you can go about not exporting that. And so you can you know, get the original file or something else after the fact. Um, but from a default behavior perspective, um, just I would use that as your um, that uh, as your key term. There's there's things that you want to do inside of Image Magic, like um, normalize uh, your image size. You want to make sure that somebody who might have used a mobile device, um, it, it didn't have this ridiculous resolution of pixels that is going to floor um, the performance as well as maybe cause issues uh, with the size of things that you're exporting. Um, so there are things that you want to do on the image magic side of things to normalize the image and clean up the image um, to keep and, and keep that information. Um, and then there's things that you want to do just to better the OCR. So I'll, um, I'll leave it right there. Um, for those that are not that familiar, let's go ahead and go. There are several steps going back into these steps of Episoft um, where there is um, manipulations when you first import it. And so there's a normalization of what's getting um, brought into Episoft before any of these things that we're talking about happens, including creating thumbnails, creating preview images, um, using for OCR. There's, there's a number of things that these are all used for. Um, this is when uh, GoScript image magic are being used to convert it. So if you have a, a PDF at the beginning of the process, the first thing that happens is this normalization, not only inside of what I was mentioning around, you know, size of, you know, making sure it's 300 DPI, make sure it doesn't go over this inside of resolution, um, but it also um, normalizes it to a single page TIFF images. And so those single page TIFF images are what being used inside of the process, because at the end of the day, what it's doing is a process on every single page. So it's classifying each page, it's OCR in each page, um, then, of course, that's used to aggregate it into documents and then, um, of course, at the end of the day, extracting information off of those documents. Um, so that's where we're going back to in the different differentiation in normalization and image manipulation between Image Magic and RicoStar. All right. Let's go back. Hold on. Take a drink. We should have this later and then I can actually have like a, a cocktail. Um, but maybe another time. Um, you can also use regular regex extraction. Um, so that's a lot of red, um, regs in, in a particular term. And what that is referring to is what I spoke to a while ago. So you can actually just say, hey, here's a pattern. Do that on every, on every single page um, and extract that information. So it might be useful if you really don't know where that is, if there's no keywords that are um, going to be associated with that. And it ha but it has to be a very explicit pattern. Um, so we'll go back to that. I don't use that that often, um, to be honest, um, unless uh, the only time that that might be useful for is if you're trying to extract off of maybe uh, a, an email, the email itself, not necessarily um, a form or a semi-structured form that is um, attached to that. And so um, let's say that you're doing um, customer service and you might find um, keywords on there um, like, um, you know, address change. You might want to be able to use that. That way you can classify that thing that this, whatever's coming in is an address change. You can also use it if you're using it from a customer perspective of saying this is a customer ID, policy number, um, incident report number. Um, so if there's things that you can um, extract off there, they're very explicit, again, very explicit patterns, then you can use that regular regex extraction. Um, Key value extraction is the most common extraction that's out there. So key value extraction is um, I have a, a key, I have a value, I'm going to get that. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly because we're going to then look at some of these. Um, cross section extraction means like I have a header, I have something to the right or left of it, and then I'm going to intersect those two lines and then I'm going to be able to find some value between those. Uh, paragraph extraction. So look on everything, you know, multi-line, Look for a particular pattern between in, inside of this paragraph. 
Uh, very useful if you're doing like contracts, um, you know, things like notes, um, mortgages, things of that nature. Advanced barcode extraction. Um, this gives you the capability of being able to look at pages and be able to um, identify various barcodes. Um, and there's three different types of barcodes that you can, or engines that can find barcodes, a bunch of different barcode types. Machine learning based extraction. So machine learning based extraction, there's a capability of being able to um, have operator assisted machine learning. So operator assisted machine learning says, um, you know, the, an operator says, learn this thing. And it's because they clicked on some value and then there's some logic around, okay, what words are around it? And then you can configure that a little bit. To be honest, we don't use this much, don't even recommend it that much. Um, just because the um, two based um, rules, it's kind of hard to go back and fix rules um, that are incorrect that an operator might have put in. And uh, configuration management becomes very difficult. Uh, configuration management mean meaning that these are learned in real time and they're on their production server for the most part. And so um, having to push those rules inside of a lower environment, knowing that you're synced up when you're doing development at the same time inside of a development environment is, is difficult. Um, if you're interested in talking about that and when it could be used and when it should be used, uh, reach out to me and we can we can have a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, fuzzy database, uh, we do use this often. So fuzzy database gives you the capability of being able to configure and saying, hey, just look for these things within um, uh, the document that might also be inside of a database. And so it's kind of like a line match of saying, if you had like a customer, and this is really powerful when you're looking at like accounts payable. And if I had a database of all the vendors and addresses and fax numbers um, that, that are inside of a, uh, possibly inside of a particular document, then you can just look through those entire documents and saying, oh, okay, this is this particular vendor um, because I found that vendor name and the address and everything else. Um, and so this gives you the capability of, especially when there's huge variance, of being able to create extraction uh, when when um, when you have that data source. Um, there are some issues with it. Again, you know, like a lot of times you can put, uh, you, you can be just look at every single page, or you can say, hey, when you pick up this policy number, that policy number belongs to an individual, and then put the rest of those fields in. So that could be a little bit more powerful as well. Um, the there, so there's different ways to set up the fuzzy database. Um, depending on what your application is, this could be powerful. Um, and depending on how big your data set is. Table extraction is exactly that. When I have repeating um, information, how do I set up? So it figures out the columns and the rows and extracts all the different lines that are inside of there. Um, and scripting, whatever you can think of. So whatever you'd like to do under the sun in the sense of um, I want to look for that policy number and then I want to go to a line of business system and then I want to pull information out of there. Um, I want to go to an accounts payable system and I want to look for that PO um, that was extracted. Does that actually match a PO that I have in the system? So there's different ways that it, that is going on. Um, so you can, whatever you can dream of, you can do inside of scripting. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of those just to get some relevance here. Okay, so what I just set up here was just a simple invoice and this was not meant to really do anything other than show you what this means. So I set up a, a particular, a, a single document type and a single field and I just made that field, uh, that field sample. Um, and what I did was just set up a couple of extraction rules so we can see what that, what that looks like when you're setting those up. And so you can see the key value that we're looking at right now. It's exactly what we kind of described. You find a key, you find a value, um, and then you say what kind of particular patterns they are. Uh, what you, you can lift these up, you can make them, you know, do whatever you want to do. Um, you can make them the right size that you want to have it. Um, and we'll describe what this does behind the scenes and kind of logically. Um, and then you can test your rules. Um, there's a bunch of other things around weights, which will take down the confidence, um, what page we're going to look on, uh, which values to find, um, and and that's all pretty well um, documented. If you, um, uh, let's go ahead and, um, if you look at the documentation, you can see what these things are, and we'll go to some of them in just a bit. Um, and then you can test a rule once you create it. 
So in this case, I found one of those, it's the right value, I can ship it. So that's what key value is. We're going to go ahead and discard this. Cross section, very similar, but you're going to have two anchors. And so in this case, I have um, a, he a heading column. Um, in this case, this header that I used is below it, but essentially it's just looking for coordinates. And so um, it doesn't really relate to that. And then an invoice, uh, in this case, invoice number is my row heading pattern. And then it's going to make this triangulation in between those to find this particular value. There is a search destination. <coughs> so depending on if your uh, if your row heading is to the right or to the left, you know, um, that's going to be what it's going to search on. Again, you can go ahead and um, you can test that out and be able to find that you, in this case, you find that exact same value. Uh, let's go ahead and cancel out. Paragraph extraction, a little different. Um, in this case, what we're looking for is we're looking for um, a header um, or a start pattern um, inside of that paragraph and an end pattern. And then it's going to look for this paragraph. And in this case, I'm looking for what is an interest rate. Um, and so it's going to find this start. It's going to find the end. It's going to kind of look between. And the nicety around that is it, it's not really looking for, um, it can do line wrap. So if you have an address that goes um, from one side to another, um, you can do that. Um, again, you can do a lot of tricks within the regular expression that you're looking for, and then you can find your particular value. Um, so the rest, I'm not going to really go into that much. You know, there's barcode, like I said. Um, you can create validation rules. You can manipulate what you extract. That way, it's the format that you want it. You can do things like changing it. Um, so. So it's uh, you know stripping off the dollar sign if you're trying to create uh, a, a, an amount that doesn't have something like that. So you can actually do some calculations. Um, you can um, get a sub uh, a substring of a larger string. That way you can find uh, maybe a, an area code of an address, things of that nature. All right. So let's go ahead and pop back in to the presentation, and we're just going to get into the first aspect to that question, if you even remember it. Um, of uh, of how do you actually, what are the tips and tricks? And there's a bunch, there's a bunch more than here. Uh, the first thing is order matters. Um, you can trump a value with another value. Um, so um, look to see what order that you wanna actually create them in and, and you know, last is best, um, if you will. So if it uses that particular pattern. So this is using different plugins is what I mean by the order. Um, so there could be, um, you know, that you're using key value, you're using RicoStar, you're using cross-section. Um, if you're using all of those for a particular uh, field extraction, then just make sure that you um, know that it might be trumping one or another. Um, and hold on, I got a few more questions here. Uh, uh, so the, the wrap line will look to see if it actually wraps that pattern. Um, how does the confidence scoring work for KV? I'm just going to get into that right now. And what is the relationship to the weight assigned? Um, so um, we're going to kind of flip back and forth, I think, inside of these two, um, uh, inside of the presentation and the other one. Um, so, you know, per the questions that were just asked, weight matters. Um, so what it's going to look for is the highest confidence extract, uh, extraction. Um, that happens first. And so what I mean by that is if you have a confidence of 100 and a confidence of 100, it's going to pick that first confidence of 100 um, that for the, for the selected value that it has. If you have alternate values selected on, they'll still be inside of the XML and can be uh, presented to operators inside of a validation screen, um, but it's going to select by default that first highest value. And uh, set weights uh, from specific to more general. And what I mean by that is when you're creating multiple rules, and this is getting back to the original question of if you're creating a, a general set of extraction rules for something that is very variant. Um, so an invoice, I have 10,000 different vendors that, that I buy things from. Um, how does that affect? And so uh, I find that my most, uh, and this is based on volume as well as um, repetition. Um, so if I find that that uh, um, total amount is my, that's the baseline rule, and to the right of it, that value 
um, is usually the amount that I'm looking for. Occasionally, it's to the bottom of what I'm looking for. Um, and so what you have to do at that point is you're saying, okay, well, I'm not gonna diminish my weight. And so if you go back to what those weights look like inside of the user interface, you can see that the default weight is one. And what that means is it's just gonna multiply, well, that's the highest amount. And so it doesn't diminish the confidence of that particular extraction occurrence. There are, um, so this only goes from zero to one. So I can say that this is 0.5, and so the highest that, that that would ever be is 50. When it comes to having multiple of these, um, you have to start stack ranking. What is the probability of this happening? And how do I want that particular rule to be featured as a confidence set? Um, and so it's, it is a balancing act. And so you start adding on rules. Chances are, if you're adding on the rules to, to deal with exceptions that are occurring when you're inside of production already, then um, that's going to have a lower weight. Um, so I know that that's a very generic type of um, answer, <laughs> um, but that that uh, it is it it is something that you have to get used to doing. And if you're creating a um, extraction, uh, a set of extraction rules for a very variant um, type of uh, field. Um, Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next aspect here that we're looking here. Be as specific as you can be for key and value. And this kind of has to do with the weight as well. Um, there is an aspect, uh, well, there's a couple different things that you can do that we may be, uh, going back to here, doing something very generic like dot plus. Um, this was just an example. What I would probably do here is saying that it is a digit and this is going to have a couple things that I'm going to have inside of here between um, five and ten digits. And so I can validate that and test it. And you can see that I found exactly that. Um, if I did dot plus, then if this if I knew that this uh, um, was a digits or was a set of digits, um, then it still would pick up if one of these was, uh, if this four was accidentally OCR'd as an A. And so what you might be able to do is, um, you know, I still want to get that even when there's an OCR issue, is that if I created something like a dot plus, which was very generic, and this is getting from specific um, to generic, I might say, hey, I want to extract that just so we know that we actually found it. So an operator knows where it is, it's going to stop because I'm going to set what my confidence threshold is. Um, um, below uh, or above whatever this is going to be. And so I might set that weight as much lower. Um, and you can have, you know, one to n different uh, different rules for extracting that particular value. And so that's what I mean by be specific as you can be for the key and the value. So start there. And then if you need to get more generic because of OCR quality or because sometimes there's instances where it's not matching it, then make sure you're also using your weights um, to be able to lower the confidence of those particular instances. Uh, this is something that we found is performance of extraction. So the more rules you have, you can have some issues around performance, but I think that even more so um, when you're looking at some of the performance metrics and baselines for benchmarking, uh, they really don't go inside of a lot of the different mechanisms that we went over. And so I've never seen benchmarks uh, for paragraph extraction or a cross-section. And I have seen it take a while. So just be aware of that. And so start with the simple things like key value and only go inside of the other ones like cross-section and paragraph if necessary. All right, hold on. So I know that we didn't go into that, um, all aspects of that question. And I think that we will. In future, um, in future sessions um, of, of this office hours. Um, I had another question come in. If your value is set to, uh, okay, so the, the digit's 510 and the OCR picks up A instead of four, how would you convert it to four? So uh, in that case, that would be the more generic dot plus um, that you would want. So if, if that was a, an, an A in this case, it wouldn't pick it up at all. And so that's when you start going into the generics. Um, converting it is really dependent on 
um, how you want to convert, uh, um, what you want to do, and what the rules are. Um, the easy answer to that is that I could create a rule inside of format conversion, and I could say I want to replace every single, I know that that's supposed to be a number, and so any sing, in, single time that you find an A, go ahead and replace that with a four, because that's a typical OCR issue. Um, that's, the, that, that's the easy answer. Um, does the confidence score apply to the key and the value? Um, just the value. And so um, there, the, let's go back into the key value extraction. Let's go ahead and close out of this and not save it. Oops. And let's go back inside of here. And so this particular, um, the, the confidence um, is, is based on what it found. Uh, and so that's where you have to be very um, knowledgeable of what you're doing inside of the regular expression um, because it, you might find just a portion of it. And so if I were to put something like, I want a digit and I just want three digits. It's gonna find three digits in here and we can validate and we can test that. And we can see that that lowered the confidence because it found two sets of three digits. Um, it found, a, uh, and, and then I can start messing with it and say, I want you to find the first one of that. Um, and this is gonna manipulate it because this found all of them. Um, so there's there's different ways you can manipulate this. Like, um, again, you know, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, but the answer to your question is the confidence is based on whatever it extracted, and that's based on um, how you created that regular ex um, regular expression. So it can find a partial match. Um, the other piece to that is the the fuzzy percentage, which we didn't really get into. And what that starts doing is a couple of things. And so this is based on the key that you're doing. And so you can find a percentage of that. And so if I said something like 20%, 20% of these characters can be, um, can be incorrect and it would still hit that trigger point. Um, the other aspect that's not really mentioned inside of the user interface is when you use fuzzy percentage, um, to any 10, 20, 30, then it starts doing case insensitivity as well. All right. <laughs> okay, um, so let's go back to this. Um, so those are the aspects that I was going to cover today. Again, we're gonna we can get more into this, especially if I don't get other questions um, that are. Um, it's an interesting topic of how you what your options are for extraction. So. You know, at this point, I want to just pause for a couple seconds. Are there are there other aspects that you want to cover? Maybe not even that have anything to do with extraction in today's session. Well, I'll just keep that open for a second. Um, but uh, I do have an announcement while we're waiting for other questions, of possible questions. Um, no class next week. Uh, you guys are out on spring break now. Um, it so happens that I'm going to be talking at another event around the same time as this. Um, and so I'm trying not to uh, go over capacity. Um, so uh, instead, sign up for that. Um, I have a 15-minute session at the AIM virtual event, Intelligent Capture, your roadmap to business efficiency. Um, there's other people that are talking. You might want to stay for the entire session. Um, in case you want to sign up for it, you can either um, search for um, those terms or you can go to this URL and sign up for that particular event. Um, I think that our session is around 1140 Mountain, uh, 140 Eastern. Um, but of course, you know, uh, I may go on before since it's a virtual um, event. Um, they're preparing us to, if somebody's having technical difficulties, um, to be able to go on prior. So sign up early and um, show up early um, if you if you do plan on going. Um, and that's what I have prepared for today. Um, but we will be back the week after next with the same session. So keep questions coming. Uh, tell people about it. I want to keep on uh, having people attend and, and, of course, keeping the conversation going. That way we have this not only uh, interesting conversation, but also um, these artifacts that people can go back and look at and you can reference. Um, and so I appreciate your time. Uh, but on that note, I think that we are done for the day. I don't think that we have any other questions that are on the queue. 
So thank you for coming uh, to Office Hours with Professor Pat, and I uh, think that we will call it a day. Thanks, Pat. I just want to let everybody know that we're going to send them an email with a link to this virtual event, so you don't have to copy it down right now. Um, we'll also send you the reminder that the class is canceled for next week, and we will see everybody back here on May the 6th. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody.